The next speaker is a good friend of mine. He uh, has been active in politics for more than 15 years. He was a, a BNP party official for a long time. He has spoken at two AMREN conferences. He has appeared on Red Eyes several times. He spoke at uh, one conference in Stockholm that I organized together with Logik Verlag in 2015. I very much appreciate his speech. Please welcome Matt Tate. Thank you for the introduction, Frodi, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to come and contribute to another conference that you have uh, excellently organized. So, um, also thank you all for coming. It's uh, an amazing turnout, so it's great to see so many people at a conference like this. And this is my first time in Denmark, so it's also good from, uh, from a travel perspective. Okay, so I, I should first of all say that what I'm talking about today is a topic on which I'm not professionally qualified. It's just something that is of great interest of mine and uh, it's something that I've read a lot about. So um, I want to make a disclaimer that I'm not a doctor or a nutritional expert. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about is from an evolutionary point of view, how we've been told in the same way that we're told things that are wrong politically, that we've been told things that are wrong uh, nutritionally and in terms of lifestyles that we, uh, we treat as normal. So, um, I would encourage you to do your own to do your own research, and if you have any any kind of a health issue, to uh, to be very careful with any changes that you make based on what I might say. Now, I think everyone in this room will be wise enough to know that liberals seem to like to tell us how to see the world. They they tell us that everyone is equal, that men and women are the same, or that uh, these things these 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 notions of difference don't exist. The same thing goes for ethnicity or race. They say that these things are unimportant or races just don't exist. It's just a social, uh, a social invention. Now, we know better than that because we have an understanding of our own biology. So we're willing to look at scientific information related to how we evolved. And I think that that understanding of our evolution gives us a better grounding with which to look at the, uh, the topic of my talk today. The very same institutions who tell us that uh, equality is the greatest moral good, that the sexes don't exist, that different races don't exist, and who try to encourage us to dissolve our nation states and all of the things that we know about all too well. These are the same globalist institutions who are telling us what is healthy and what is unhealthy. Uh, and I'm particularly talking about what it is that we are supposed to eat. You've probably heard newspaper headlines and um, th there is a generally accepted notion, for example, that saturated fat causes heart attacks and clogged arteries, for example. You may also have heard that vegetable oils are more healthy choices, maybe margarine, for example. That red meat is bad for you in some way. You should choose leaner meats like chicken or fish. And if you have chicken, you should take the skin off before you eat it. You may also have heard these uh, familiar moral arguments that liberals like about how animal farming is immoral. Now, there are, there are two sides to the, the issue of is animal farming immoral. One is about animal rights, and that one I think probably everyone here would agree that they've seen things about animal farming which uh, would turn their stomach, that they don't want to see animals raised in this way. Uh, and I think we could probably all agree that animals should be treated with respect. The other side of that is a bit more complicated, and that is that animal farming is in some way immoral because it is bad for the planet. And of course, the green movement has become very, very powerful over the years and is probably at an all-time high of their power. And a lot of people will say that animal farming is immoral because the, the amount of land that you have to use or because of the amount of water that you have to use to create the grain to feed the animals or that uh, the animals are giving off gases that cause a hole in the ozone layer. So this is another another line of um, of argument. Sorry, a bit louder. Yeah, I'm going to have to hold it into my beard a bit, so it might rustle. <laughs> okay. Another claim that you may have heard is uh, that vegans are healthier and live longer, or even just vegetarians live uh, live longer and are healthier. 
And I think probably of, of all of the claims on, uh, on my list here, the one that seems to me the most obvious, or was the most obvious to me, was that fruit and vegetables are innocent, natural, virtuous, good food choices. And even that I'm going to challenge in, in what I have to present to you today. Uh, before moving on, I thought I would just again stress the, uh, uh, the, the some of these things are health related, whereas some of them are simply about moralizing. So I think it's interesting how uh, veganism and vegetarianism is often a kind of nutritional form of liberalism, and liberalism often uh, frames itself in a moral I ideology. It will tell you that it won't, it won't argue with you logically. It won't talk to you about science. It will tell you what they believe is is right and good, and that. And then this is also why they will often have this very strong reaction against anyone who disagrees with them. It isn't because they think the facts are different and that there should be some kind of a debate. It's just that you're a bad person. So um, the, the way that I kind of see this is uh, you can regard veganism or vegetarianism uh, is, is kind of like the, uh, the physiology side of what liberalism is for your psychology. And they're both promoted by the same class of globalists and globalist institutions now. So my question is, is it possible that based on what we know about these globalist institutions and about the, uh, the spokespeople for liberalism, that we perhaps ought to take a, a, a second thought about what we've been told in regards to these guidelines? And you can probably guess my answer. My answer is certainly yes, we should. And it's, uh, it's a very complicated subject. So. I'm, I'm really going to struggle to, 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 to talk about everything I'd like to talk about today. But at the end, I'm going to give you some, uh, some extra homework or uh, you know, optional homework that you can go and do with, with some good sources of information to make up your own mind. So from what I've said so far, it, it, it may seem that what I'm trying to do is to take aim at vegetarianism and veganism. It isn't really just that. It's, I want to take aim at a greater trend, which is even just the balanced diet idea, the food pyramid that the World Health Organization promote, which is probably very familiar to you, just as it is all across the Western world and probably far beyond. Uh, has anyone not, not, not sort of vaguely come across this idea of a, of a food pyramid? Raise your hand if you haven't come across that. Yeah, almost everyone has, has come across that. It's a very common thing. So, uh, before getting stuck in, I thought it's worth just recapping what we know about our evolutionary biology. People in our, in our kind of groups tend to know about this kind of thing. So, we know that evolutionary selection pressures shape an organism over huge periods of time. We also know that for over two million years, really up until very, very recently, relatively speaking, the, uh, we were in an ice age. And that ice age only really came to a close 10 to 15,000 years ago. So in terms of evolutionary time, we really have evolved in an ice age. In this time, ice would have covered huge amounts of the globe, and certainly in the areas that Europeans evolved, which is, I think, most of our ancestors, the, uh, the ground would have been covered by ice for probably the majority of the year, if not all year round, at certain times during that period. We also know that during that period, our brains increased in size dramatically. We have the largest brain to body ratio of any animal. This development probably was driven by selection pressures for survival in this climate, which include the ability to communicate. So things like language, a very large part of the human brain is related to uh, linguistic things about, about language and understanding each other. Uh, also, cooperation, ability to work as a team, to hunt. You know, in this time in the Ice Age, there were a lot of very big animals around, like woolly mammoths and other megafauna, which are no longer around today. Also, thinking about the future, planning, general intelligence, you know, the, the, the kind of things that we're aware of in relation to, for example, the issues of IQ. In addition to these things that we already know, it's worth noting that because of the ice on the ground, there would have been a very severely limited access to plants of all kinds. Um, very much the, uh, the, the megafauna, these big animals would use their bodies to move the snow out of the way and to eat the mosses and lichens that grew underneath. Humans weren't capable of doing that, but what we were capable of doing is eating these animals. 
Also, it's worth noting that animals in colder climates tend to be larger and they tend to carry more fat to keep them warm. And this will be a bit more relevant as, uh, as my talk goes on. Okay, so the food pyramid and all of the advice that we are given about what to eat and what not to eat is based on scientific studies of all different kinds. Now, there are, there's a kind of a hierarchy of scientific studies. And at the very bottom, in nutrition science, you've got the epidemiological study. This is a study that determines in some way um, what might be the cause of someone's death or illness. And an epidemiological study is often very, very weak. It's not capable of really determining a causation. So, for example, I've got a, uh, a very interesting graph that shows a perfect correlation between the consumption of margarine in the state of Maine and divorce rates. And I think it should be fairly obvious that people eating margarine in the state of Maine are not becoming divorced because of any, uh, any relation to what they're consuming. But this is exactly what all of this advice is based upon this kind of a study where they will, for example, say, these people over here, uh, they died of a heart attack. What did they do in their, in the, in their lives? And they will say, okay, they, uh, they ate this food, they did this amount of exercise, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, that just isn't good enough for determining a cause. It is just a correlation. And science is full of very amusing correlations that are completely in no way related to each other and there is no causation at all. So whenever you see something in the newspaper, for example, like uh, another one you may have come across is red wine can help, you pr uh, help protect you from cancer because it has some kind of antioxidant properties. And I, I think this is more wishful thinking than anything else because I can tell you that the scientific research that uh, that's based on is when they took a very small element, a very small chemical within red wine, isolated it, created a unnaturally large amount of it, and then gave it to people as a supplement. Drinking red wine, you will never get that amount of that, uh, of that chemical from it. So the newspapers like the story. You know, it's like when the newspapers want to, uh, you know, it's clickbait kind of stuff. They want you to see these interesting headlines and be like, oh wow, I'm gonna look at this information and learn something, when actually, They've just misinterpreted science, which has been badly done in, in the first place. So it's a kind of uh, Chinese whispers. So what you really need to determine a causation is a much more complicated and difficult, rigorous kind of scientific study. Something like a randomized um, control group trial where you're controlling for other factors. So to, to give another example of how this has been, uh, how this could be an issue is, um, with the issue of saturated fat. Is saturated fat bad for you? Most of the reason that people believe that saturated fat is bad for you is because of an epidemiological study or various epidemiological studies that look at how much saturated fat someone eats and how likely they are to die. Now, the issue with that is that there are various confounding issues. So we've been told that saturated fat is bad for us, therefore, the kind of people who eat a low fat, a low saturated fat diet are compliant people who want to do the things that they think are best. They're going to be quite conscientious. Um, they, they found that people who eat saturated fat, uh, more saturated fat are more likely to smoke cigarettes. They're more likely to drink alcohol to excess. They're less likely to exercise. And all of these other factors that they just do not take account for in these studies. However, they see a correlation and then they take a causation which is not true, and they have not controlled for these other things. So, are vegans more healthy? Uh, is, is it a healthy thing to do to adopt a vegetarian or vegan diet? Well, it certainly can be, because the diets that we tend to eat these days are so bad. So if you were to adopt a vegan, uh, a vegan diet, you'd probably get rid of a lot of junk food that you might be eating. Perhaps you'll stop drinking Coca-Cola. If you're feeling in that kind of a mood that you want to improve your health, maybe you'll exercise more. So often when someone adopts a vegan or vegetarian diet, they do make some, uh, they do have some, it has a beneficial effect on them. But it's not because they're eating plants and it's not because they're not eating meat. It tends to be for, uh, for other reasons. This is, this is the sort of um, the conclusion that I've come to from the things that I've, that I've read. 
So certainly a typical vegan or vegetarian diet is better than the Western diet or what's known as the standard American diet or SAD, but really that is as far as it goes. An interesting study that took place over five years studied, um, studied some, some, some people and measured their brains at the beginning of the trial then um, put them on a different diet, some eating meat, some eating a vegan diet. In this study, they showed that the people eating a vegan diet suffered over five years a 5% brain shrinkage. They did not find the same shrinkage in the people who were eating a diet that included meat. Uh, they also interestingly found that the smallest brain of a person eating a normal diet was larger than that of the largest brain of the vegan in the study. Now that's just one study, it's a small study, so you can't read too much into it, but I'm gonna go on to some reasons to do with the, 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 the types of nutrition you find in, in, for example, animal fat, that might lead you to think that that's actually quite plausible. So just to tackle a couple more of these, uh, of these claims about things they tell us are healthy for us. Are vegetable oils more healthy? Well, perhaps olive oil is, um, is, can still be classed as a superfood, but a lot of what is known as vegetable oils are not really from vegetables, they're from grains. So for example, what we have in England is rapeseed oil. In America, that's called canola oil. Uh, these things are grains and it takes an, an awful lot of effort to get oil out of these things. And the type, of, the type of fat that you get from them is incredibly volatile. It easily goes rancid, and rancid fats are incredibly bad for you. They're carcinogenic and can cause all kinds of uh, immune responses in your body. Also, they're not good for cooking. If you cook with lard or if you cook with butter or if you cook with a very stable animal fat, you won't get the, 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 the changing, the, you know, the trans fat effects or the, uh, the smoking and burning of that fat, which can also lead to some issues. So when you cook, you should really should cook with a very stable fat, but often people use vegetable fats for cooking, which is really just not a good idea. But the main issue with them is that they are unstable and they go rancid so quickly. Is animal farming immoral? Now, I personally feel that, that we need to have more strict rules with how people are, who have animals in their care or to look after them. Uh, I also believe that animals are, should be in their natural environment. They should be outside. They should be eating grass. If they're a cow, they shouldn't be stuck inside in a shed. And I'm entirely against the mass farming um, methods that have become popular more in America than I think in, in Europe. But things are always seem to be going that way. The, the other issue to do with is it better for the planet to not have animal farming. I would say that the main issue there is when you have monocropping, when you have these huge fields of grains, the amount of animals that die are, is, is huge the, because you have to spray everything with insecticides and pesticides. The combine harvesters have been known to grind up ground, ground nesting birds and, and, and small mammals that get in the way. And it just isn't a nice, um, it isn't a diverse, ecosystem anymore. If you've just got a vast field of barley, it's just barley. And it really, really is bad for the environment. So if you, if you truly are an environmentalist, if you are a green, then I think you should support animal farming because the animals, they eat the grass, they drop their, um, <coughs> their droppings back onto the earth. And it's a whole ecosystem with bacteria and other animals that all feed into a real, um, a real ecosystem. So, are plants good for you? The first thing I think to note here is when we're talking about plants, we're really talking about quite a broad spectrum of different things. So you've got fruits, and then you've got vegetables of all different kinds. Most tests on the benefits of fruit and vegetables are on fruits and vegetables as a whole. So, it's very difficult to isolate our fruits good for you on the one hand, and our vegetables good for you on the other hand. But I think generally we accept a kind of naturalistic fallacy in this regard that these plants, they're natural, they're, they're friendly, they don't bite you when you try to eat them. And it's something that I've fallen into myself. And I think this is the thing that's blown my mind the most to learn that plants, in fact, aren't necessarily good for you. They can, in fact, defend themselves from you. And, of course, arsenic is natural. 
and no one's going to be eating that anytime soon. Well, they won't tell the tale anyway. So plants want you to eat certain parts of them. They want you to help spread their seeds around. They want you to eat, the, eat some of their fruit. To um, The seeds will pass through because they're undigestible, and you will deposit them somewhere far away from, from that tree with a nice parcel of fertilizer. Now, maybe that's humans that do that. Maybe it's animals that are supposed to do that. But certainly, that's what humans do do. However, there are parts of the plant that they do not want you to eat. They do not want you to eat their body. You know, what the plants do not exist so that we can just eat their body. And they will defend themselves against us and against animals. And in fact, most plants are poisonous to us. The number of plants that are not poisonous to us are incredibly small. And the ones that we do tend to eat have been bred by us over many, many thousands of years to be more beneficial to us. And we've bred out some of the negative things and we've tried to increase the yield and the sweetness and everything. It's taken a lot of effort. But there are chemicals in plants, for example, goitrogens, lectins, and oxalates. And these are the plant's self-defense mechanism. The plant can't run away. It can't fight back when you try to kill it and eat it. But what it can do is chemical warfare. And plants are experts at chemical warfare. These chemicals can play havoc with your gut. They can play havoc with your immune system. And I think that there is uh, some research that shows they may be related to allergies uh, and the way that your body responds to unknown external threats. It should also be noted that 99.9% .9 of pesticides are chemicals made in plants to defend themselves. So we are taking the plant's own chemicals to defend themselves, and we are making pesticides out of them. Modern fruits are much larger and sweeter now than they were in the past. And also, the way that we would have eaten plants in the past would be on a seasonal basis. So at a certain time of year, you'll have blackberries. Another time of year, you will have apples. So if you're eating these things, then your body will have time to flush out any toxins that you've taken in. And on that basis, you will not build up a, uh, an overwhelming uh, toxic load from whatever it is you're eating. But if you're eating these things all year round, then you do have an opportunity to build up an, un uh, an unhealthy level of goitrogens or lectins in your body. And there are all different kinds of lectins, for example. And um, they will hang around in your body for a while. You can flush them out quite easily. But if you're eating them all the time, then your body has just a chronic, uh, this chronic environment with these, uh, these things around. So we've seen that there is reason to doubt the nutritional advice we're given. And it should be noted that humans are the only animals suffering chronic illness in the world. The only animals that suffer chronic illness, except our pets. And why is that? It's because we feed our cats and dogs corn and wheat and sugar. If you look in dog food, cheap dog food, it's full of carbohydrates and stuff that dogs just are not evolved to eat. So what are we supposed to eat? Let's just take a look at our digestive system and digestive systems in general. The gorilla is a very closely related animal to us and they eat nothing really but leaves. So let's have a show of hands. Who thinks that gorillas are on a low-fat diet. Raise your hand if you think gorillas are, are on a low-fat diet. OK, OK, quite a few people. Quite a few people here are a bit more, uh, bit more red-pilled than I thought on this issue. Um, so gor gorillas eat leaves, but gorillas have a very different digestive system to us. They have a very large cecum, which in a human is a tiny appendix. And this is something that's full of fermentative bacteria. So these leaves that the gorilla eats will be fermented by the bacteria in its gut. And in the end, it produces short-chain fatty acids. So this animal is on a high saturated fat diet. The gorilla gets 70 to 80% of its energy from saturated fat. Now, it's not doing it directly from leaves, but because of the bacteria, that's how it works. A gorilla has what they call a hind gut digestive system. Cows are a bit different. They, they do exactly the same thing. Uh, they also get 70 to 80% of their energy from 
short chain fatty acids, saturated fats. However, they are a foregut digester, that is they have many different stomachs and the bacteria exist in the stomachs. Also, they will uh, regurgitate what they've eaten and, and eat it again. Um, so they have a very strange way of, of, of doing it. But the important thing to realize is all herbivores are either one or the other, and humans are categorically neither. Our digestive system is much more similar to that of other carnivores, uh, based on hydrochloric acid and a uh, re relatively short digestive tract, which means we don't have big, big guts like gorillas and, and apes do. So what, is, what do our ancestors believe? Well, if you've ever seen cave paintings, you'll, you'll know that uh, our ancestors hunted big animals and um, often these paintings would show very fat, almost comically fat deer or comically fat uh, bison that they would be fantasizing about eating. And by all accounts, there is not a single cave painting of, of someone picking fruit from a tree or growing a vegetable or eating any kind of plant material at all. In the Icelandic Edda, it said that in Valhalla, the feast will be set with clear wine, with fat and with marrow. That's bone marrow, not the, veg the vegetable marrow. And bone marrow is a very fatty, highly nutritious part of the body. In the Bible, Cain and Abel made offerings to God. And I think it was Cain who gave an offering of uh, grain. And God was not impl impressed. Abel made an offering of uh, a fatted a fat animal, and God was very happy with Abel. At the return of the prodigal son, the father uh, slew a fatted bull. And what did our ancestors actually eat? What do we know about that? Well, by all accounts, coprolites, which are the fossilized remains of human feces, show that from the period of time before agriculture, there is no record at all of any plant material in any coprolites ever found. What they do find is a large amount of uh, organ meats and bone marrow and a lot of evidence of uh, early humans breaking apart animal bones to get into the fattiest, most nutritious part of the body. And it's also uh, interesting that when you see lions hunt, the first thing they go for is the organs. They go straight into the guts. They want to eat the liver. They want to eat the kidneys. They're not interested in, in, the, um, in the muscle meat so much. Okay, so I haven't got that much time then to go into a guy who I really look up to called Weston A. Price. He was an American dentist who went all around the world looking at primitive uh, peoples eating their traditional diets. He found people in all different tropical places. In terms of Europeans, he found two different types. One was a very remote Swiss valley, another was the Scottish islands. He looked at what they ate and he looked at how their teeth were because he's a dentist. He noticed that with the, with the populations that had access to the what he called the modern displacing foods of modern commerce, there were lots of dental cavities and health issues. When he went to a place where they were eating the traditional foods, whether it was raw milk or, or, or meat, or even some uh, societies where they ate a lot of uh, more carbohydrates and plants, uh, he found healthy people eating these whole foods. Now, the reason that the populations who were eating more carbohydrates and plants had been doing quite well was because they adopted the ancestral processes of how to remove the bad things in these foods and how to increase the nutrition. The way you do that is through things like fermentation. So, for example, in, in Eastern Europe, they like to ferment cucumbers. Uh, and, and, to, um, and to make pickled things, sauerkraut, for example. And this is a fantastic way of making plant foods safe and nutritious for humans to eat. It's almost like doing what cows and gorillas do inside their bodies, outside their body, adopting, using bacteria to, to help us in the process of digesting it. There's always a focus in, these, in all ancestral primitive peoples on special sacred foods for young couples, babies, and pregnant women. And those things are always animal-based foods. Usually the, uh, the milk from cows who are fresh to pasture or uh, things like fermented liver. The human brain is made up of long-chain fatty acids, 90% of the human brain. We can make some long-chain fatty acids out of shorter-chain fatty acids, but we're not very good at it. The only real source of long-chain fatty acids that make up our brain is from animal sources. We adapted in a cold environment because of the challenges we faced, but we could not have adapted and have to have the brains that we have today 
if we did not have the fuel to build them, the building blocks that they are made of. The fats that gorillas and cows get are not the same fats that we get from eating animals. Today, our brains are shrinking and our IQs are declining. It's interesting that most of us are avoiding the kinds of foods that our brains are made of. I think that this issue of nutrition can be a really good red pill that's easier to swallow for many people who are not willing to take the full red pill. Jordan Peterson and his daughter are spearheading a popular movement towards a more carnivore diet. And Joe Rogan has had people on there to speak in great detail about, uh, about this. Uh, and I encourage you to listen to those things. Uh, I also think that understanding nutrition and the limitations of science can lead to a better understanding of uh, how to determine fact from fiction in a world where we're trying, that people are trying to deceive us all the time. And this even can lead on to things like race realism. Some criticisms and limitations I would make of, of what I've said, for example, might be uh, people will say, what about vitamin C? How can you get vitamin C if you are on a, on a meat-based diet? You get scurvy or something like that. One of the, uh, the answer to that from the people who are the experts is that when you are running a fat-based metabolism rather than a carbohydrate sugar-based metabolism, it's much, much more efficient. You do not produce so many oxidants, therefore you do not need so many antioxidants. Also, vitamin C and, gl and glucose are almost ch chemically identical. So if you're eating a, a diet high in sugar, then your body isn't going to be able to absorb as much vitamin C anyway. Also, people might say that too much protein can spike your insulin, but that seems only to be true if, the, uh, if that person is also eating something else that is causing that issue. It doesn't seem to be a big issue. I'd also uh, warn people about a partial adherence. Uh, you know, go away and do your own research into these things, make up your own mind. But there is a danger that if you, for example, start eating a diet that's rich in, uh, in red meats and cholesterol, but you also don't stop eating grains and vegetable oils, that you could find yourself in a worse position with your health than you are even now. So you do have to be careful when adopting these things that you're doing it the right way. So, uh, if, if that's enough, if that's enough, and if you want to catch up with a bit more time, I'll leave it there. I think that's enough to whet your appetites. But what I've got here is uh, I've got a slide which I'll put up now on the screen behind me with some recommended sources for some more reading. Uh, I hope you find those things interesting. I recommend every single person on this list very highly. And also, of course, I'll be around to answer questions and um, take any criticisms of what I've said later. I'd, f I'd find that very interesting. So thank you very much.